Good afternoon. Woo, <laughs> Jesus. Woo. Okay, so they, they did say that we were mic'd up. Um, so firstly, I'd just like to say a big thank you to everyone that's come to hear us on our little dreadful chat. Um, firstly, I'd also like to thank um, NZGDC, the organisers, and all of the amazing volunteers for putting on, in my opinion, one of the best uh, conferences that I've ever attended. This is my second year coming here. I had such a good time last year. So um, thank you very much for all the hard work. Um, just a quick disclaimer. Uh, we basically are going to talk through our process, but there's lots and lots of different ways to achieve success in making games. And so really all we're trying to do today is just share some of the outcomes and learnings that we've um, cottoned on to along the way. Um, but uh, you know, we don't claim to be experts, that's for sure. Um, so Arcus is, um, we're just a small little startup company. There's just the two of us. In fact, as of last week, we are now three. Um, but just the two yeah, of us. Yeah, we got ourselves a game designer last week, so that's a good addition. <laughs> yeah. Um, back in 2020, just as the pandemic was hitting, we launched our um, first board game, Shelfie Stacker, on Kickstarter, um, which successfully funded, and we delivered um, a year later. And um, at the moment, obviously, the game of today's topic is um, Dreadful Meadows, which is the game that we're going to be talking through today. And we have a number of other games in development. Um, the only one that we've really very briefly talked about um, was um, Storm Chasers of Atlantis. Yeah, and Dreadful Meadows hasn't launched yet. It'll be launching in, on Kickstarter in October this year. So just a, a little bit from us. Um, we're going to burn through these first few slides fairly quickly because we just want to cut to the game stuff. But it's, I think, good to get a little bit of context for who we are. Um, so, as I said, we're pretty much a team of two, but we have a game designer, obviously, for our board games. Um, we also have um, some friends and uh, contractors that dial in to help us out a huge amount. Um, I've been in the entertainment industry for just short of 20 years. I've obviously spent most of that time at Weta Workshop, working on a bunch of films. Uh, but I've also been very active in the community, um, in the arts community in New Zealand, uh, coming up with White Cloud Worlds, um, and also being um, part of the team that brought Wellington Industry of Imagination. Um, but more recently, obviously, I met Nicola at Weta, and that's where we sort of started to working together. Yeah, together. so I'm Nicola. I've been in production roles in the entertainment industry for over 12 years now. I um, started off in animation, um, worked in mobile games for a little while, but um, most recently I've been in consumer products for the past seven, eight years with a focus on board games and collectible figures. And yeah, we sort of met working on um, Weta Workshop's board game, uh, Heavy Hitters. Um, and then a couple of years after that, uh, we started talking, well, a couple of years ago, we yeah. started talking about maybe we had so much fun making Heavy Hitters that we decided it'd be fun to actually um, take everything we'd learned and start our own board game company. Yep. So one of the things that, obviously when there's just a couple of you making games predominantly, um, it's going to be a part, well, for us anyway, it's definitely a partnership. And probably the key thing, um, even though a lot of our slides are kind of sort of dividing into kind of like creative and production, which is, we're doing that a little bit just to help with the inflammation flow. But I want to make it very clear that, in fact, the reality is that we cross over a tremendous amount. We definitely, I'm definitely a little bit more specialised in the creative yeah, and so there are areas of production that I mainly manage and own, but Paul will always get to have a say. And yeah, it's very open dialogue. We work together before we approve and sign off anything. Yeah, so it's, it's very much a, a partnership, yeah. um, which is the way that we really enjoy working with each other. Um, so that's just a little thing we wanted to cover off. Okay. Yeah, so this is just, uh, sorry, we're just going to run you a bit through about us and um, the Arcus brand. So the two types of people we're looking to attract um, are a community of gamers for ourselves who love our brand and love what we make, but we're also looking um, to pull on board other creators. We're doing this through things um, like um, super high quality components. So a board game can just be paper, card, and dice, and a lot of great games are those simple few types of components. But for us, we want that wow factor when people open the box. We want very tactile experience. We want people to be picking up all the pieces and engaging with them. So we're playing with a bunch of different materials in the games that we're designing. And 
A couple of the other things that are really important to us is holistic design and engaging at every level. They're both a little bit similar in some ways, but we, we take a very big, wide view of the worlds that we're creating, um, and but we try to make sure that every little part that we're building interlocks seamlessly with each other. So it's kind of that classic stepping right back and making sure that everything makes sense, but then honing down to the smallest, tiniest detail, um, the tiniest component, and getting that as good as it possibly can be as well. Yeah, and Feature Creek may seem like an odd one, but for us, we want big ideas. We want to work with people with huge ideas um, because some of the best components and um, even mechanics that we've implemented to date have, have come from those crazy conversations. And honestly, if anything, it makes for a good laugh and a fun time making games. Yeah. Um, creative empowerment. Um, obviously, uh, I'm a huge believer that you start with, with creative and you go blue sky as much as you can before you start to rein that in. So a big part of our process is about empowering creatives to really explore something in a really exciting way before we start to then sort of ground it more um, from a commercial perspective. Yeah, and um, have fun, make fun is pretty obvious. We love making entertainment. That's why we're both still in entertainment after so many years, um, and we want to have fun doing it. Okay. So why, though, why did we move from film um, and mobile games and animation into board games? Um, when we met on Giant Killer Robots, one thing that we noticed um, with board gamers is because it's a social experience, you're, you're around a table, there's no room for jerks. If you're a jerk, you don't get invited back to play. Um, and it's the same with the people who work in this industry for the most part. Everyone's really lovely, really supportive. Um, it's a way of exploring new worlds, so um, we can't make a film. We can't make a mobile game ourselves with just the two of us. Um, so this is another way for us to tell our story. Um, Crowdfunding-wise, um, if you are a board gamer, you may have likely backed a game on Kickstarter yourself. It's a very established um, publishing platform for board games. Small indie game designers use it to publish their, their card and paper prototype games and large um, players in the space, huge publishers also use it. Um, and yeah, it utilizes our range of experience. We know how to make, design, and ship physical product. So, works for us. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of the coolest things about making board games is that we get a chance to not just be, you know, we get a chance to write, we get a chance to illustrate and design and produce and all the rest of it. So it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity. You know, I think when we often work in bigger companies, you get typecast into a role and that's all you do day in, day out. Mm. This is just something that we can use our full skill range on. Cool, so we do have a bit of a process when we're looking at um, potentially green lighting a game, of course. The first thing, like all games, is it fun? Did we have a good time playing it? Did the people we were with have a great time playing it? Um, we also need to be thinking about the theme and IP. That's a huge component for us. That's a huge reason why we're doing what we're doing, is we want to tell stories through board games. Um, so is there a good fit? Category alignment is more around um, the mechanics. So for us, we're publishing games which are light to medium weight. Um, we're not doing like heavy strategy minis based games at this point in time anyway. Um, for us, we've also had to work with credible game designers. So we've seen some good games but um, from up and coming designers, but um, we needed people, sorry, designers who had published titles behind them because that is not a skill set that either of us had. We needed to know that that person was going to help us see the product right the way through. Um. Qu quick wins. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, quick win. Well, original IP and licensing. So we want to do a lot of our own original IP, but we also want to work um, with people that we know who have great IP. Um, so where can that fit? Quick wins is around component tree. So have we designed a game? Have we manufactured a game similar to this before? Has the game already been play tested a heat before we've seen it? And if all of those things are perfectly aligned, then we hope that we can fit it into our schedule and green light it. So this game today um, is designed by Lucas Grace, or in gaming circles, he goes by Lucas Adam. Um, he's a game designer out of Auckland. Uh, he produced, he was a one, one person team who designed and produced Galilean Moons, which won a New Zealand um, PAV award. Uh, and 
uh, lucky for us, we got an, introduced to him uh, by our new um, partner, Shem Phillips, uh, from Garfield Games. Uh, and coincidentally, probably this was, um, we were just starting to look for our next game, and uh, we were sitting, myself, my wife Claire, and Nicola were all sort of sitting around, and we were talking about what kind of game would be fun to do next. And my wife Claire is a huge Halloween fan, and so the joke was, wouldn't it be amazing if we could do a Halloween-inspired game? Literally, two weeks later, we were sitting in front of this game at Counterculture, and um, Lucas had themed it with a Halloween theme as a prototype. So we, we were up and running straight away. Instant one. So the subject for today's talk, um, Dreadful Meadows. We're going to break the talk into sort of three very basic phases. It's kind of the classic kind of production phases. Um, and we're just going to sort of try to work our way right through that process. So where world and gameplay collide. So this is effectively what I'd call pre-production. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, this is that pre-production phase. And what we're doing here is we're trying to take that core game that we've been given to, to play with and see if we can make our theme, our IP, um, work beautifully alongside it. So we're not adding anything at this stage. We're just making sure world and game collide and work beautifully together. Um, so by the end of this, we need to prove that that's working as one before we continue to develop it further. Also, at this point, um, on my side, I'll be researching um, other similar games that are out there if they've already had similar IPs put on them, price points, um, all the boring accounting and legal stuff, which none of you are interested in, and Paul is... Not interested at all. Either. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Um, I'm and yeah, and my from my perspective, and we'll be going into this with um, the following slides in a little bit more detail. But in this stage, it's very much um, research. But it's about starting to find that core idea, um, that visual identity as well, and the core theme that you want to explore alongside the game design. And in this case, Lucas kind of already kind of gave us that, and we were already interested in doing a Halloween-inspired game. It's not a Halloween game but it's a Halloween-inspired game. So uh, one thing, one quick tip I wanted to give you all early on, these are the tools that um, we use. A lot of you will work with these every day already, but the two you might not have heard of is uh, Tabletopia, Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator. Um, these are great online tools for um, making digital versions of your board game really easily. So it's great for playtesting when you can't get people around a table. Um, even um, now I use it to create fake renders because I don't have a 3D artist on tap. Um, yeah, it's super useful. So Yeah, and then pretty much as we're, like I said, we're a very small team, so we're just using the pretty standard um, sort of software sort of stuff. So. Typically, kicking things off um, and talking more from the, the thematic and art side, the creative side, um, typically I'll start with doing a very wide, well, we both will actually, we'll do quite a wide um, sort of round of visual mood boarding. Um, it's easy to sort of fall down a, a rabbit hole of images and you can create, you know, Pinterest boards of thousands of images, but at the end of the day, it's about the curation process and actually cutting that down to something useful that's what, when it starts becoming more meaningful. What we typically don't do when it comes to creating an IP for one of these games is we don't often have the IP in mind. So, and also, I'm generally, I can write, but I'm not someone that's gonna sit and write the IP first and then illustrate it. I actually prefer to try to find the IP through more of a visual process because I'm a world builder from the film industry and that's generally how we sort of work it, work it up. So what we tend to do is start to distill down that visual inspiration into some, and start looking for patterns that I find interesting uh, and start to try to circle around some key concepts like theme, visual styling, um, sort of some ideas around our character cast. And the key thing you're also wanting to try to look at at this stage as well is what are you thinking about your audience and what might appeal to them? So it's very similar to the video game industry in that respect as well. But a lot of, for me anyway, a lot of this process is quite intuitive. It's, it's actually just finding something that resonates and building upon that. Um, also, the other key part of this process is knowing who's going to be producing the visuals. Um, in this case, it was going to be my wife, Claire. Um, so obviously, that's her work in the top left. Um, 
And so obviously wanting to find and build a style that's going to complement her skill set um, and her character design um, capabilities. Um, but I was also quite influenced by Tom Robinson's work from Pickpock. He submitted those hipster um, characters for White Cloud Worlds Volume 2. And what I took out of that was that it could be really fun to explore a contemporary twist on a classic monster character and also love the level of ornamentation. But there's a whole range of other inspirational um, shows that we were looking at for different reasons. And that sort of boils down into some of these kind of core sort of themes and ideas. Uh, yeah, so as we're having these conversation, uh, conversations and the IP is beginning to be talked about and developed and we're playtesting, something I take charge of is I capture um, a lot of the key words that are said. So even um, with playtesters, just anyone, um, if there's a word we haven't got down, I write it down because these words can inspire not only the characters, storyline, um, they can also help to inspire the game name, Kickstarter names, um, so much. So a um, huge bit of advice, as lame as it sounds, and I know it sounds lame, write the words down. You'll be surprised how often you do end up referencing that list later on, especially as you move towards publishing. And probably just briefly talking on this, because this is a very, we're at this stage of the game, this is literally right at the start. Like we've played the prototype a few times, um, we've started to get a little bit of an understanding of what um, aspects of a world we can introduce. The original prototype actually didn't have any characters. It didn't have a game board either. So these were aspects that we knew we wanted to bring to the game because for us, an IP is best explored through character um, as a chance to start to build um, and tell stories visually. But um, just being and talking about the importance of what's in a name, Coming up with a really interesting and intriguing product name is super important, and we will spend a lot of time brainstorming ideas for um, a product name. Um, and so far to date, Nicola has always come up with the winning name. Um, and one of the first things that I'll do um, is something that I learned at Wetter time and time again is we call it make it real. So the quicker you can make it into something that seems real, like you could literally slap it on a, a, a product or a box and, and get a read off of it, the, is the best way to test something to see whether the name or the idea sticks. And so I literally, um, once Nicola coined the word Dreadful Meadows, um, I immediately spent an afternoon just smashing out some quick hand-drawn logos um, to try to explore what the look and feel of that um, property could be, because the, just the name itself already started conjuring up ideas of what the um, style could, how it could influence the style of the whole property. This was it. I did one afternoon's work on the logo design, and it was done. So it's, it can be quite a quick process if you feel like you're on a bit of a, a good streak. The, the next thing, another, the next part of the process that I'll often spend doing, which isn't art related, um, it's just a simple um, logic chain exercise that I do. Um, I'm doing, I used to do it just on pencil and paper, just pages and pages of it, but now I'm lazy and I do it on mirror. Um, but it's just, it's looking at um, the core concepts of your game and how they align to the world and how you're naming of those components is starting to shake out. So for example, on the left-hand side, I'm starting to think more about the world. You know, we've got this place called Dreadful Meadows, so I've decided to work backwards from that and try to work out what kind of world would Dreadful Meadows exist in, and I'm thinking it could be part of Candy County, which could be part of the United Counties, because it could be riffing off the UK. And then working down from that all the way to trying to work out how these, this meadow is divided up into these kind of supernatural candy farms. So these are just simple um, bullet point kind of logic exercises, but it's so fast to just test something. And then the other thing that I'll often do is I'll start to write some of these names into copy as an exercise to test to see whether it sounds any good, because ultimately you're gonna be doing a lot of copywriting for marketing and rules. So it's a good chance to start to try to work out whether the name of something resonates or not. Um, so these are just simple, quick exercises that just help you move the project forward and lock off on names. Yeah, like we, there was, um 
we use these words that say poles mapping out and that I've captured in playtesting. Um, so one that we ended up in a bit of a debate about because it's a tile placement game, but whether that tile was going to be called a patch, like a pumpkin patch, or um, a, a meadow field. or a field. Um, so playtesting the words in the game as well. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so this is a little shout out to um, Claire. Um, so in terms of the, one of the first things we wanted to do is we wanted to find our cast of characters. Um, in this case, most, because it's not like a film property where there's a script to follow, we wanted to actually find our world and our IP through characters first. Um, and ideally, I personally like to just let the artist go for it um, with, with a quite a wide and open brief. Mm. And so um, Claire, um, who'd already done a bunch of Halloween work in her own time, started to work up a character lineup. Um, and, and, and we knew that we needed probably a four characters primarily, but we were hoping she might give us a few more. So this was just her very first round. And then I asked her to sort of start to work up some uh, more sketches that were sort of uh, starting to focus a little bit more on, on the sort of the different families that we were sort of thinking. Because it's kind of like a supernatural farming game, we sort of thought that potentially starting to, to bring the characters in alignment to candy that they farm could be quite a fun con concept. Obviously, Jack and Pumpkins is a really obvious one. Um, but one of the really fun ones that Claire came up with was um, Luna, who's like a phantom mellow character. Um, and that became one of the names for the characters um, for the, um, the candy. So from those quick sketches, again, I spent maybe two days tops taking a bunch of those sketches, bringing them into colour and doing a bit of a quick render pass and most importantly, trying to explore uh, a graphic design and ornamentational pass. One of the things we really wanted to do with this game was to really dial up the level of ornamentation and to make it feel incredibly rich and interesting and with a lot of hand-drawn ornamentation, um, not stock imagery that you can just buy online. Um, it's partly because I just enjoy doing it, but I also think it does help give a real sense of value. Some of the inspiration that we were drawing upon was the arts and crafts movement. Like, we were looking at that intersection between the Industrial Revolution and the traditional art movement of the time and that intersection in the UK. And so that was something that we started to build into the theming of our um, artwork. We also wanted to get these really strong colours, as when that's obviously a really strong gamification thing. So, again, I spent maybe two days working these up and showed them to Nicola. We didn't go much further than this. I mean, I've worked on projects for which have lasted months in a design phase. Um, sometimes when you're, you're confident that you've got something that's working, there's no harm in just actually just saying that's it and moving on. And that's kind of where we landed. So um, the only thing I'll just mention on this slide is when you're, if this is for people that are art directing artists, if you've got a lot of faith in the talent of your artists, and you know we certainly did in this case, um, your only, often your only real job as an art director is you've got to be careful that the artist doesn't lose the genius that they've struck on. Um, it's a, as an artist myself, it's a very easy thing to sometimes overwork or lose that thing that makes that sketch or concept special. Um, and so this was, this was clear getting just a little bit lost in the woods on a couple of the characters um, and then very quickly um, finding, going back to her original pencil drawings and finding the, the genius again. Can I jump in here? Um, one other thing, um, when it comes to the art for the components, you can see here with these player boards, um, we really could have just requested the upper body, but something we make sure we do, um, and like I, I ask for a lot now, is that the whole character is designed because you will get so much reuse out of that full body piece of art than if it was only just drawn for that single component. And you'll see more of that as we go on. Yeah, so a big, a big part of our early process is trying to um, focus on a couple of hero components that we solve a lot of our problems on. So in this case, the, the player board, this was one of the 
I'm not, not a final component, but we took it to a sort of final place for a pre-production phase. And what we got out of this playboard exploration was we found our illustration style, we found our graphic design and ornamentation style, and we kind of more or less found our color formula as well. Um, and so once we kind of got this far, it was quite a quick process for Claire to then go back into um, designing the thematic plants, candy plants, that are gonna go with these characters. And again, the other great thing with working, um, like I said, we have a very small team and, and very multi-skilled. Claire's a really good writer in her own right. And I knew that if left to her own devices, she'll just come up with a bunch of great names and characters. And so she started coming up with um, names as she was drawing the characters, she was coming up with the names of them as well, which we ran with pretty much all of them. Yeah. Um, this is a good example of a quick win from the um, initial prototype that we played. This diamond shape functioned perfectly mechanically, but also aesthetically, it was a win. So we, we ran with it. So these are some of the super first concepts you did. Yeah, and yeah. this was our very first, these made up our very first prototypes. But shape language is really important. Um, and yes, this, we, we've reused this diamond shape again and again and again. And this is just um, very placeholder art for the theme so that when we are testing it again, we're just ensuring that both are working together. Yeah. Um, and that's the other thing too, is it's, an, it's definitely an evolutionary process. Um, you can't be afraid to just run with a crude prototype. You'd be amazed how much information you can still get back from yeah. that around colors or style. Yeah. Um, you know, you will make it better as you move along. Yeah. Uh, um, I'll, I'll start. Um, so um, in, in board games, a huge thing um, is table presence. So when your game's all set up and people are walking by, you want them to stop and look and go, wow, what is that? Um, so as Paul mentioned earlier, this, this game didn't have that central component to hold um, the market functionality of the gameplay. So we knew there was an opportunity there and we knew that's one thing we wanted to resolve first and quickly. Um, so board game. <laughs> And um, the bat board, as it became uh, called. Uh, so we we're, were talking before about this idea of designing a hero component to solve problems. Uh, it's a, it, in the film industry, we would do it with like a hero prop. We'd potentially solve a whole, you know, culture, culture's I visual identity through maybe designing a hero piece of armor. Taking that same principle with the board is the same thing. It's like we're effectively trying to, it's such a complicated, piece of design because it's got to work for gameplay, it's got to work um, visually, and the other big thing for us, because this is something we really like our game boards to do, is you can use it as a storytelling device for when you're play testing it or for someone to help explain the concept of the game. And so these quick illustrations that I've mocked up here using some of Claire's um, elements, the whole concept with it is that you can just about talk through the function of the game through the illustration. Yeah. Um, yep. and, and that, but that was an evolutionary process. I got a better illustration that did it better further in. Right, making so, it real. Making it real, so this is the next phase. So now we know the, the core game and that theme. We've play tested it. We know that it's working well, um, naturally. Um, so now we're going to start um, printing um, and play testing in person. We're moving the product into that development phase, so yeah. Um, so early on in the pre-production phase, I'll have a master game design spreadsheet, which will um, just house the, the components, the, the basic text for those, um, the quantities of things. From there, I make a basic checklist um, of concepts that I need from Paul. Even though he could work with the spreadsheet, I've never met an artist um, who, who enjoys it. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so that works for him. So now in the development phase, you're taking those those, um, those early components and you're beginning to specify the scale and the materials and the final quantities. So this, you have this other, sorry, on the far left, you have this master spreadsheet. <sighs> Sorry, <laughs> this, one, this one is what you constantly updating. This is the file that you're gonna send to the factory for quotes. Um, this bec becomes like my go-to for everything. 
But the main point I want to get across with this, this is a snapshot of our process for the two primary file outputs that you're going to need when making a board game. So you're going to need files for the factory, and you're going to need files for um, your digital version and your own prototypes. So once Paul has locked off on the shape language of a component, I'll make a um, vector-based die line, which I'll link his art to. So as he moves ahead and he's updating the central art um, of that design, it's as easy as me relinking it, and then I get whichever export I need, or both of them. Um, I know some of you will probably know how to do this process a lot in a like, much smarter way, but um, what I'm trying to get across is have a system, have it easy, and have it early on, because this will take a lot of time, as you'll see on the next slide. Yeah, and I think when you're running a very small team, um, and it, when we were developing this game, Claire was only, um, she had a full-time job, so she was only illustrating outside of working hours, and I was working still mostly full-time at Weta, so mm. we had to be very efficient with whatever free time we had. Um, and so this kind of structured sort of output yeah. takes, takes that heavy lifting out of it. Yeah. So this just goes to show how much iteration can happen from the art side. I wouldn't necessarily have relinked each of these pieces, um, but it just when we needed a fresh print or a fresh export for Tabletopia, it was as simple as relinking. And then it was done. And it was done. Yeah. Um, so obviously, uh, a big part of um, board games is it's tactile. You're physically interacting with it. I mean, I think we always talk about our games being hopefully delicious and just about good enough to eat, which is why there's a choking hazard on the box. But <laughs> the, the key thing is, especially with a game that's like candy, right? You, you want everything to be super yummy. Uh, and so one of the things that we knew was going to be a big part of the game was the, the physical components, not just the artwork, but the actual components themselves, and how could we make that as yummy as possible. So, um, and also, most importantly, how do we convey the, the, the game through the components, like make it easy for the player to learn the game yep. and enjoy it? Yep, and so whilst these designs are being done, um, I'm also asking Paul or making them myself quick um, concepts that I can send to the factory to get pricing. Um, so within a, day or, like, within a day of having these designs in two days, I'll have prices back from the factory and I'll know if we can go for our feature creepy injection molded um, skull candy or if we need to go with wood or plastic tokens. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you are shop uh, shipping a game that needs to turn a profit if you want to actually survive. And so... Um, the cost, the unit cost, is a big consideration um, for us. Um, but what, the balance we're always trying to find is the very, you know, the best components we can afford to still make it viable, I guess. And the cost difference, getting these, getting a variety of quotes will surprise you. Um, sometimes what you thought would be far too expensive is actually only like a cent or two different from the more basic version. So feature creep. Yeah. <laughs> Um, just, a, an, a, again, anyone that's um, in games, really, this is sort of preaching to the converted here, but being consistent with your, um, I guess, with your UI or your shape language or your, your game con, um, conceits is a big part of, um, of what we're trying to do is, you know, using colour and, in this case, how we can extrapolate character design so often it was taking Claire's original character designs and then doing a more graphic representation of them and how that links to other components that are thematically linked. And so at the top we've got like the little player meeple that's going to go on your player board and then the middle row is the, the characters, the sugar sprites that are going to be um, uh, that are in the in-world character, and then finally you've actually got the, the, the different candy plants that they're linked to beneath it. So just trying to keep that really consistent, because when you're looking at a board game, I mean, most of you guys have played board games, I'm sure, it can be a daunting task learning a new game, and you're trying to do everything you can to make that process as easy as possible so that they want to play it again. There's so many games that I've started reading the rule book and literally just put it down because I, it just, it's just too daunting. Yeah. So we try to do every trick in the book to take the pain out of that. And part of that is just making it as cute and fun as possible. Um, part of, because our world building is quite an organic process, um, which we find a lot through design rather than say writing, uh, 
it does lead to some fun discoveries. Um, our part of the game required there to be these concoction cards. And when we first started, they were going to be cauldrons. So it was a quite a fantasy kind of bent to the game, which I found boring. Uh, and then Nicholas started showing me real candy cookers. Uh, and to me, they just look like robots. So before you knew it, we were starting to do a steampunk sort of Victorian-esque kind of world started to evolve alongside of this kind of supernatural um, sort of world that we were building. And so that's how we ended up getting our, our um, sort of what I'm calling magical machinery um, and, um, and even starting to work some of this into the backstories of our characters. So our Igor character now is becoming the front person for Igor Industries, which was a thing we just made up on the day. So this kind of organic expansion of your world through just allowing some of these designs to see where they lead you is a really fun part of our process. Um, and just this is just showing, um, because this is like the production phase, I guess, um, we're just showing that leap um, from an early prototype to, um, to a much more final prototype. Um, so you'll see that with the player board, we really did luck onto something that pretty much worked from day one. And the amount of um, changes we made to it was very minor, um, other than just trying to give it a little bit more agency in the game by actually you know, keeping your little workers on it, which was a fun sort of add-on. Um, but with the, with the backboard, that was a, a much, much longer process in terms of trying to find something that um, really clearly illustrated the world, but also fit, managed to fit all the components and in a logical sort of process. Yeah, and instead of the um, board, uh, say, just folding in half like most game boards would or into fours, um, we've designed it so that the two wings open up. Um, so it's just those, those, little, those little touches. Um, the player boards have also become a place where your sugar sprites are stored. So in games, um, people love managing their little setup in front of them. So that's what we wanted in this game as well. And we um, managed to achieve that with the player boards. So a, a, lot of, um, a lot of good ideas for componentry will come, again, from around the play testing table yeah. and being really... Um, being really observant on how people handle components, like whether they'll group them together, where they'll place them next to them. Yeah. It's, there's a real kind of psychological science behind it. And the more that you pick up on those little cues and the more that you pick up on those kind of um, tangible sort of things that people like doing with components, the more you can sort of try to do, bring that into your component design to enrich the experience. Um, one of the things you don't generally think about too much when you're doing prototypes is the other side. Um, in video games, you don't normally have to, have to worry. Well, you do have to design the back of characters, I guess, but it's something, you know, for the longest time you'll be doing a prototype, which is just one side, and then all of a sudden you'll get to a point and go, oh, yeah, we need to design what's on the other side. And, and often we'll go through the production and we'll be like, oh, crap, the back. <laughs> like, yeah. so, so one of the things, uh, this is where a big part of our our business process, our creative process, is the art of the reuse. We will try to find a way where we can reuse assets as much as possible. So all of that crazy ornamentation that I've been doing for the player boards, I can start to resample that and generate a whole bunch of um, additional ornamentation, which can then be used to put on the backs of things. Um, and again, the whole thing is, the goal here is, A, I just love doing ornamentation, but B, it's to kind of give the game a real sense of value. And these are clearly hand-drawn. They're not, they're, you know, they should feel hand-drawn because that's the aesthetic that we're going for, that kind of arts and crafts aesthetic. It also allows um, myself or the game designer to take elements of what Paul or Claire has designed. And if we have an idea or we need to quickly prototype something ourselves, we're not having to sit and wait for Paul to get us stuff. We can just smash it together in the time being and um, move on and then bring it back to him at a later date. And having fun with components. You know, it could have just been a dice bag or a tile bag. Yeah. It's way more fun to call it a Sinister Seed bag. <laughs> and then you start to build that into your storytelling for the game. Oh, it's Sinister Seeds. They go to the market. You buy them from the market. You grow them. Rather than, you know, just basically saying you bring a tile out of a bag. 
Um, I'll just run through this quickly because I think we're running out of time. So this was us um, running uh, in-person playtesting at WellyCon. So you can see on the far left those, those dashboards we're talking about. Three out of the four people are using them as we'd hoped, whether it's lining up their concoction cards along the side. Um, the top image there with everything on the board, um, that proved to us that there was, even though we designed it to, to functionally help the gameplay, it was now becoming overcrowded. So we knew we were going to have to resolve that. Um, we knew the tiles, even though we printed them on cardboard in final manufacture, that was probably going to be double the height. So that's where that um, sinister seed bag came into the production. So yeah. Right, the final phase of the talk, putting it in a box. Yep, so now, we're, um, now we've, we've got our final things that we need to fix, and now the goal is to get it to this point, the first sample from the factory. Um, so this is all about the polishing and um, moving towards, yeah, uh, launch. So this is where we landed with all of our final sort of art componentry. Um, one of the, I guess as a small startup, one of the few things we can't do like really expensive minis, uh, which we would love to do. I'd love to do a little horrid harvester. Um, so one of the big things that we do with our games like Shelfie Stacker and um, Dreadful Meadows is that we're putting a huge amount of time and effort into the art. That's the one thing we, we feel we can really over deliver on is the art and design. Um, and so this is kind of where we landed with what we consider to be a hopefully a fairly lavish um, looking game. Um, so these are the kind of um, the final components, which can then got sent to China. Um, this was our final character lineup for our four primary characters. Um, one of the things we, we do is, as well is we sometimes keep things simple. So rather than complicated names, we do simple names. So it's just Jack, Nina, Luna, and Igor. They've all just got four letters. They're all easily positioned on a player board. They're easy to remember. Um, so just little things like that can sometimes be quite helpful when you're designing characters. Obviously, a big part of it is shape language. Um, our final sort of um, patches of supernatural candy. So we've got, um, by this stage, we'd landed on um, pumpkin, cop, pumpkin pops, <laughs> gummy globs, treacle teeth, and phantom mallows, and also candy trees, which were kind of the wild um, tile. Right, the rule book. Yeah, during this stage, uh, now that we know how everything's working together um, and all the components are locked, the rule book is a massive job, but it's so important because, as Paul mentioned earlier, bad rule book is the barrier between um, the player actually playing your game. Um, so we try to make it as engaging and, and as entertaining of a read as we can, um, whilst making it very easy to reference. So when you have your rule book, even if it's just a document, um, I cannot stress the importance of just giving that black and white piece of paper to someone with your game and saying, tell me if you understood how to play. Um, yeah, and here you can see a lot of the reuse coming into play again. These renders were actually all done for now using Tabletopia. Um, yeah. And um, I think obviously the rule book is a chance, um, or from my perspective, it's a chance to bring in some of the world that you've been developing, because that's obviously one of the key objectives for us is to actually start building an IP through a board game. Um, so instead of just cutting page one, cutting straight to the game setup, our first page is a new character that we've created called Cornelia Cavity, um, and she's a reporter that's been sent to the Deadwood Dreadful Meadows to report on this season's contest. And so we're using, we've just created a whole new character to effectively build a story about, so now we've kind of got like an unreliable narrator that's gonna introduce each of the characters that you're now gonna be playing. So this is the way that we sort of start to try to wrap world into just a board game experience. Um, of course, uh, that character also just happened to feature as a, as a feature creep <laughs> character as well. Yeah. Um, with the game board and the, the board uh, box, the, the, obviously one of the most important images you're gonna come up with, um, and this is true of video games as well, and books and publishing, it's, it's what's on the cover. You know, people, people are not going to play your game when they're looking to shop. They, they can read the description of the game, but they're not going to be able to experience the game. They might at best watch a playthrough. So the cover is kind of like everything in terms of convincing. You're trying to get the, 
the person to engage, to be curious enough to want to at least turn the box around and find out more about the game. Mm. So we will spend, if, if some of the other design stuff went very quickly, and it kind of did, we kind of just got on a bit of a roll and we were approving things very quickly. Things like um, the, the, uh, the board, the illustration board, and the game box took a lot of time. We spent, I mean, I must have done like 16 different versions at least. <laughs> so that's where, it, that's where you really do have to spend a lot of time getting it right because one of the things we found when we started marketing games online is that if you make the mistake of releasing an early version of the board game cover that you don't end up running with, it hangs around, mm -hmm. which sucks. Yep. So we tried to delay showing our cover of the board game for as long as possible until we do have that image most of the way there um, so that when people start searching on it, particularly on the run-up to Kickstarter, they're not going to find an older version of that board game cover yep. that looks pretty average. Um, so that's where we landed with the, um, the final um, board game cover. And so obviously the key objectives for me when sort of putting this illustration together with a lot of Claire's elements was we were trying to evoke a sense of the world, Dreadful Meadows, you know, what does Dreadful Meadows look like? Um, we're leading very strongly with a character that we hope will resonate the most strongest with Halloween. Even though we don't want this to be categorised as a Halloween game, it was always our intention to try to launch this game during Halloween to get extra tra traction. And so that's why leaning with Jack, is we felt was the, kind of the safest option. It also means that from a hierarchy perspective, we've got a really strong figure that's going to pop from a long way away and then we've still got our secondary cast of characters playing out in the background and you know I think we talked before about trying to engage at every level you can literally break this illustration into levels that step you into the world there's Jack who's our featured character at the front with with the the candy which is the primary part of the game right at the front so we clearly see all of the cool yummy candy plants and then as you step back into the world, you're starting to encounter more depth and more of the characters and more of the world. Um, here's an example of the reuse. So once all of those final files have been exported and I've sent them off to the factory to begin getting quotes back, I can begin playing with the digital versions of those and doing mock-ups for promotion. Um, and then I'll send that over to Paul and he might put the final touches on it if he likes it. Um, yeah, just a really good example of the reuse coming into play. Um, we were talking before about how much we love feature creep. You know, a great idea, you always file away because you might find a chance of bringing it back. And with Kickstarters, um, and particularly with board games, you really want to try to launch a mini expansion with your game to try to capture, you know, capture the attention and capture um, hopefully a little bit more revenue. Um, and so for us, this was a chance to take a bunch of ideas that kind of didn't make it into the final game, but were with um, some clever work from our game designer, we were able to then bundle into what's going to become a little Tricks for Treats expansion, which has an extra two or three different gameplay um, options. And, and this lets us take some of those cool um, sort of ideas and just sort of bring them still as part of the main package, which was so, really cool. So even though um, earlier on in the production, the, the game designer will be testing, play testing these ideas on, a, on his own, um, and, and with people, of course, but um, it's only at this stage, once we've got the core product done, that we'll really begin finally executing the art um, for these pieces as well. And... I think, we'll, this is pretty much the last slide, um, where we'll sort of finish up the, the kind of goal for us, like we haven't obviously launched yet, but we're, we're literally, you know, literally about to, we've just started to announce the fact that we're about to launch and we'll, we'll sort of be announcing the date very shortly. So much of our success as a, as a company is going to rely on Kickstarter at this stage. And so it's really important that we, we come out strong with what we hope is a standout identity which in this case is showcasing um, the world and the promise of the game in a really strong visual way. Um, so this is one of the key um, sort of assets that we've created for our Kickstarter um, launch. Yeah. Um, 
And preparing for launch is epic in itself, and that is the topic for another talk. Um, but um, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I also want to pay acknowledgement, um, even though we do sort of say that we're a team of two, and obviously Claire and there's our game designer, uh, we, there's no way we could have got as far as we could have got without the very generous support and help of a number of people that have chipped in their time and um, expertise to help us. Um, for instance, the person that does our incredible um, Kickstarter videos for one. So um, I think that's the lovely thing about working in Wellington and the creative industry here in Wellington is that it's an incredibly supportive environment and that people will take the time to help you out if you're well-intentioned and are willing to pay it forward. Yeah, and look, like if any of you are considering making your own game and you have questions about Kickstarter or manufacture, all that side of things, poll for art, just get in touch with us. We're, we're happy to tell you even more than what we've been able to share with you here today. Um, so that's it for us, um, but uh, thank you very much. If you do have any questions, we'll exit the, um, the theatre, but we'll hang around a little bit. If you do just want to ask us some questions, we'll just be available for the next sort or of Or if you want to see the prototype. You're yeah, come and have a look, <laughs> yeah. Um, otherwise, hopefully, um, yeah, yeah, hopefully you'll enjoy our game. Thank you. Thank you.